Good morning. Good morning, morning, Senate Finance, and to our guests. Today is Monday, April 10th. It is, uh, we have uh, six or so bills that we're going to take up this morning, as much as we have time to before we need to get over to the Senate floor by 11. Uh, We have one bill that we're going to discuss that's not on the yellow sheets in front of you. So, Patrick, you can get us started. Yeah, so this is a concurrence, uh, or I guess in this case, a not concur from the House. Um, this is House Bill 282. This is the bill that provides for the licensing of mortgage loan originators who are independent contractors. Um, and you know, the, the Senate amended the bill to narrow it. So um, the licensure of these mortgage loan originators who are in, independent contractors are also ones who are licensed insurance producers in good standing under state insurance law. And then there was an insurance, then there was an amendment that had the um, Commissioner of Financial Regulation just do a report. Uh, So the House um, elected to not concur, not concur to the uh, to the Senate amendments um, on this bill. Senator Beidle. Madam Chair. So there's an issue with, and I, I'm not going to quite get this right, but there's, but there's mortgage brokers and mortgage lenders. And if you're a broker, you're basically the business owner and you're in charge. And if you're the lender, you basically are working for someone else like Quicken Loans or Rocket Mortgage. The difference with the, what we did was that State Farm Insurance, which is the only insurance company I know, but there may be others, licensed their insurance agents who were independent contractors to do mortgages as well as car loans. So that's why it makes them, they're already self-employed. And so it's okay to let them be brokers. But for the folks that only work for one company and are doing mortgages, it's really not okay. They are, they are, they need to be under regulation and they need to be employees. So I have a problem. I, I loved our, I loved our amendment. I thought we did a great job putting that amendment on. I have a problem passing it without the amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Vice Chair. I, I don't know what to do at this time. Do we, I, I like the amendment. They worked it out in, in good faith. And then all of a sudden it, I know what wow. happened, but we won't talk about that, but. Um, you would have not to recently. Yeah. So right. if you if you like the amendment um, and you want to keep the amendments yeah, on, then the action be. I not do. Received. That was done in good faith, and all of a sudden now it, it's not. So I would like to keep it that. Some of their bills. So the way, the way we sent it over to them. There is a motion to keep the Senate position on what's the bill number? House Bill Two Eighty Two. House Bill Two Eighty Two. Is there a second? second. Okay, have a motion and a second not to concur with the House. Seeing no further questions, all those in favor of that motion, raise your hand. That's unanimous. And so we will name a conference committee on that bill. Okay. Thank you, Patrick. David, okay. good morning. Good morning. Okay, um, there's several bills on the, the voting list to be considered by the committee. The first bill is Senate Bill 387. This is the Task Force on Reducing Emergency Department Wait Times. Uh, the bill has been, a, you have amendments from the, uh, the, the uh, chair on this bill. It uh, conforms the Senate bill to the House bills that came across. Uh, the bill is designed to identify potential solutions to reduce excessive wait times in emergency departments, study best practices, and make recommendations on how to improve or uh, decrease the wait times, not improve, but it decreased the wait times in emergency departments. So the reprint in front of you on 387 is basically the House bills that came across, uh, but there's also... Um, amendment or changes to the staffing of the task force it, it, it cuts down the members as if you recall when this when you first brought up took up the uh, house bill there was 21 or so members now with the amendments it takes it down to 15 and you can see who the members are on the task force on pages one and two of the reprint so 
Okay, so just by way of background, we had a conversation on this bill a week or so ago, and we're inclined at that time and actually took a vote to uh, move a letter, although we had a very robust conversation about the importance of this issue. And each, I think almost every member of the committee weighed in on the impact of hospital wait times in each of our respective communities. Uh, the House has sent over a bill and... Um, one of the concerns that we had about the bill as introduced was the size and the cumbersome nature of the, uh, the, the group that would be addressing or focused on this, the hospital wait times. And I believe as before us, the bill also offers a report or requires a report. So are there any questions about Senator Vidal? I'm just recounting, David, you said 15. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm in, I'm counting in a hurry, I'm getting 18. That's team. a big task force. No, there's, let me, uh, there's uh, one, two, three, uh, one member of the Senate of Maryland, one right. member of the House of Delegates, the Secretary of Health, the Secretary, or the Executive Director of MIMS, Four. the Executive Director of HSCRC, Five. and the Executive Director of the Health Services Six. Cost from You Commission, um, two representatives of hospitals, uh, seven eight uh one representative with a pediatric emergency one representative from a specialty psych hospital and two representatives from emergency department personnel one behavioral health services and one high volume emergency services provider and one individual employed as medical staff so on line 18 where we've crossed out the um little eyes whatever we call those um that's come out completely even though the whole line's not crossed out yes Okay, that was confusing. I'll, I'll count again just to make sure. So okay. there's a uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Oh, I'm sorry, sixteen members. 16. Sixteen members. Still. Okay, still a lot. Thank you. Okay. Any additional questions about the reprint on um, Senate Bill three eight seven? I'll entertain a motion. Move favorable. I'm sorry, Senator Lamb. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, I, I share Senator Vital's concern, but it's it is a lot of folks, and they're being asked to submit a report by January 1st, I guess. Um, so their time is also very short to kind of look into this for a large kind of task force. Um, so, you know, I guess I have some concerns about that, but the, the other question that I had was mm -hmm. the, for some reason, the bill says it should remain in effect until June of 2024, mm -hmm. while the report is due in January 2024. That's not unusual. You always extend the date of the, uh, these task force a couple months beyond in case they don't get their work done or something else comes up. So it's not unusual to keep the task force going for a time beyond the report is due. Okay. This is, and this was the bill that I think if I'm recalling correctly, um, it was on crossover Monday, I think that we, at the time had suggested a letter for this. Um, yeah. Okay. Senator Reedy? Thank you, Madam Chair. I think a letter is more appropriate than an 18-member task force. 16. 16. Oh, sorry, 16-member task force. So, uh, but that that's my position. I don't know where that leaves us, but none of us want to vote against exploring wait times. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, I actually think getting... The letter getting principles together made a lot more made a lot more sense to me. Thank you, and I do hear that. I just would say that on the bills that we have had before us, a number of work groups and commissions that have been a little. Uh, the conversation that we had around this issue was very robust, and the current concerns about this matter were very robust. And I think that what. I have heard from impacted constituencies and having had a conversation with the hospital association, um, you know, it's one of the reasons that the amendments that that are 
being offered this morning by me um, are there as an attempt to put structure to what we were going to do in the letter. Senator Mounts? I have a question of clarity, uh, tracking all this. So the, the amendment would put it at 16 members? Yes. Right. And then the bill as it stands right now is 21 members? Without, without the amendments. And then the bill that was originally introduced, how many members were, were uh, um, included in that draft? Uh, let's see. Uh, one, two, three, four, three plus four is seven. Um, seven. So there was uh, there was one uh, one senator, one delegate, the secretary of health, and four members appointed by the governor, one representative from the hospital association, two from the patient advocacy organization and one individual who is employed as medical staff by an emergency department. That would be it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and to, to your point, Senator Mounts, I think one of the things that I valued in the amendments and that I got from the conversation with you all was the fact that we felt that behavioral health could be a factor um, that impacted hospital emergency room wait time. So thought that was an important addition. So I had a motion yes, did. for a favorable. You have a second. second. I have a motion and a second for a favorable on the reprint of Senate Bill 387. Seeing no further questions, all those in favor, raise your hand. That bill as amended receives a unanimous favorable report. Uh, David, I think we have the House cross file of that bill. Yes, which is identical, as amended is identical to the, is, Identical to Senate Bill 387. That's House Bill 274. Is there a motion? A mid-step second. I have a motion and a second for a favorable for House Bill 274 as amended. Seeing no questions, all those in favor, raise your hand. That bill also receives a unanimous report. We'll turn to the next bill. Okay, the next bill is... Um... A cross file. This is Senate Bill 595, and it's a cross file to Senate Bill 448, which you uh, elected to go to conference on because there was um, the, the the House made various changes to Senate Bill 448, but they forgot to do one thing. So you were going to go to conference to fix a date change. Turns out <clears throat> the, there was also some problems with what the House did to the bill. So you now have Senate, you, you now have House Bill 595 in front of you with amendments and the reprint is in front of you also. What the, rep what the uh, amendments do is they basically conform House Bill 595 to Senate Bill 448 as it passed the Senate. And uh, there are some additional changes. Instead of extending the termination date or the, the sunset date to 2025, it changes it to 2024 in all cases. So instead of having a two-year period where, where they can still direct ship to residents in the state liquor or beer, it would be to 2024. And then there is um, some clarifying language on unnumbered page, the second to the last page in the middle uh, this is also apparently agreed to language with the House that would be taken up in a conference committee amendment. And at the bottom, there is a reporting requirement for these folks to submit how much liquor and beer they are shipping in the year period. So uh, my understanding is that these amendments would be substitute amendments on a conference committee uh, on 488 and 448, I'm sorry and that these amendments have been agreed to, so. Okay, so I have a motion and a second for a favorable on House Bill 595 as amended. Seeing no questions, all those in favor of that motion, raise your hand. Okay, that's unanimous. Did you have? And move to the next bill. Next bill is House Bill 988, 
as amended, it is identical to House Bill 828, which is Senator Hayes' bill that makes modifications to the family and medical leave insurance program. They even made the, corrected the mistake that we, that we had to you had to concur to. Okay, so we have a motion and a second for a favorable on House Bill 988 as amended. No, there's no amendments no on amendments. this one. This one's as clean. not amended, as presented. Senator Mounts. Yeah, I just wanted, I wanted to make sure I understood what we're voting on for this. You're voting on an identical cross file to the Senate bill, which you passed and then concurred to uh, the past uh, two weeks ago. I think you, okay. the, so it's, it's identical to the bill you sent to the uh, hmm. to the Senate bill that you sent to the House. They uh, took okay. it up late and they amended the House bill to be identical to the Senate bill. Gotcha. Thanks. Okay, motion and a second for a favorable. I think we did that already, but that's okay. We did it again. Are there any additional questions? All those in favor of the favorable on House Bill 988, raise your hand. That is the paid family medical leave. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that is eight. Those opposed, raise your hand. And that's three. That bill receives a favorable vote, eight to three. Okay, we'll move to the next bill. Okay, so the next bill, uh, you sort of broke half while you were discussing an amendment offered by Senator Kramer. I'll refresh your memory. It requires, it's House Bill 1000. It requires a person to hold a common carrier permit to transport premium cigars and tobacco or pipe tobacco into the state. It also requires a remote tobacco seller shipping premium cigars or pipe tobacco into the state to annually provide information to the commission instead of the comptroller's office, because the commission is no longer part of the comptroller's office for these matters, and prohibits a common carrier permit from requiring a signature of a shipment to a licensed tobacconist. The bill also requires the commission and the Maryland Department of Health to take actions, including unannounced warrantless searches during the course of investigations and enforcement and requires specific notification be sent to the field enforcement division of the commission. The commission is also authorized to take actions with contraband tobacco products and requires the commission in collaboration with the health department and others to develop strategies for enforcement of tobacco laws. The bill also requires the governor's office of small minority and women business affairs to conduct a study on eliminating barriers to entry in the wholesale and distribution sectors of the alcohol industry. You have a reprint in front of you with, uh, with two, two, two parts. There was a, uh, an amendment offered by the governor's office of small minority and women business affairs to modify some of the language in the study. That's on the last two pages of the reprint. And then attached to the reprint is where you left off your discussion with Senator Kramer's amendment that would First, remove the health department from the warrantless searches criteria, but also require probable cause from the commission when they go and inspect a, uh, a person licensed to sell tobacco in the state. Thank you. Senator Kramer. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I would ask that perhaps um the committee consider a revision to the amendment a small one but a meaningful and important one as it relates to the issue that is at hand uh the amendment before you uh, reads that the executive director or the executive director's designee may search a licensed tobacco retailer's premises without a warrant if there is reasonable uh, excuse me probable cause I would like to change that language to a lower standard that reads, if there is a reasonable, articulable suspicion um, for the executive director or the executive director's designee to believe that the licensed retailer is in violation, et cetera. Um, I heard what the uh, our friends at the Alcohol Tobacco Commission had to say the other day, and this, I believe, is a reflection of my understanding of their concern with probable cause, 
And colleagues, what this does, it simply requires that there has to be some reason to believe that there is something going on that is a violation and that the officer just has to be able to articulate what that reason is. Not, hey, I just had a gut feeling something was going on, but we've been watching the facility. We saw a van pull up. We saw some boxes wheeled in through the back door. And we have a reasonable suspicion that there may be something going on. Um, colleagues, we heard from, again, and, and trust me, I have great respect for the Alcohol and Tobacco Commission. Um, it was legislation that I introduced and took a beating over uh, that created this commission. It gave birth to the ATC. Um, but I also think we have a responsibility as government officials to the Fourth Amendment, that this is a little bit different than alcohol. This is different than what we'll be doing with cannabis. There is a finite number of alcohol and cannabis facilities going forward that will exist. With regard to tobacco products, with cigarettes, this is going to pull every convenience store, drug store, grocery store, you name it across the board, no matter how large a percentage of their business is cigarette sales, it could be a tiny percentage, it could be a meaningful percentage, we don't know, but it is not apples to apples to say, well, we do it for alcohol, so why wouldn't we do it for this? Um, I think we have a responsibility to limit the intrusion into our lives by government. This General Assembly has been very focused on that issue over the last two decades. I think before we go in and say, have at it, warrantless searches, in all of these businesses, every gas station that sells a pack of cigarettes, you name it, before we go down that path, why don't we just require that there be a minimal reason to believe that there is a violation? That's what this amendment would provide for. Um, I think if our friends who are sitting right here from the ATC come back next year and say, we've got a huge problem. This is, you know, we, we need to go beyond what this legislature did in this bill with this amendment, it should be adopted. Then let's hear that next session. But they have never had this authority up until this point. All this amendment does is simply provide a, I think, perfectly legitimate, reasonable position. Hey, just have reason to believe that there is something that's going on. And I, I don't recall that we really heard that at the bill hearing. I mean, it seems to me this is almost what this should be a freestanding bill so that we really can have an in-depth look at it. But I would ask for the consideration of the committee to put this very limited uh, restriction in place. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. Senator Hayes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, I have a great deal of respect for my colleague, but I think this is going to be one opportunity. This is going to be one occasion where we disagree. Um, I think um, the ATC has already stated that they need this um, tool. I, I, I think delaying it for another year just simply de delay the opportunity to do what it is that they've ultimately already studied and said that they need. Um, also, I, I would remind this committee, we spent a great deal of time um, doing a whole cannabis legislation, talking about the Clean Door Open Act, Clean Door Open Act, because we know 
um, the harms that tobacco is bringing to our community. We also know that the state of Maryland loses millions and millions of dollars uh, for people illegally trafficking tobacco um, into our state. And so this gives another uh, tool for the ATC in their enforcement. And lastly, what I'll say is um, the, the, the reasonable articulable suspicion is applying a, a criminal um, standard to uh, what will otherwise be a, a civil matter. And so I think, although it may on, on the face or an appearance, Give the give the idea that it's a lesser standard is still applying a very serious and, and, and criminal standard that goes above and beyond uh, what we hope to re achieve here. And so with that, I would ask um, colleagues that we were, would resist this amendment. Thank you, Senator. Senator Hershey, it's yeah. Monday. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Just one Monday left. Um, I, I would agree with my colleagues amendment on this. Um, I'm trying to go through this bill and, and I just think that this is a solution in search of a problem. You know, I think this bill was brought to us because two competing retailers decided to start fighting over something and decided that uh, there was uh, something in someone's store that they didn't like and they've called the um, ATC on this. I mean, this, this is how the, the, the impetus of this is. The, the fact that this bill is coming to us after the years and years and years and years that we've been selling alcohol and tobacco at places tells me that this is, again, something that's just not needed. Madam Chair, I'd also <laughs> tell everybody, take a look at the committee testimony on this. There's two pieces of written testimony in for this bill and two favorable of oppositions from the, from the retailers and uh, convenience stores. There's not even legislation from the AT or a letter from the ATC saying that this is necessary. So I my, my point is that if they haven't done enough work to say, hey, here's a letter, here's why we need it, here's the rationale for doing all this, rather than just throwing a, a piece of legislation on the table, I'd have to agree with my colleague that at the very least, because I can't trust that they're going to go out and, and conduct these warrantless searches uh, with without having the documentation. I mean, maybe that's why they want this bill, because they can't put documentation together. So I would agree with my colleague that at the very least, there has to be some type of reasonable cause before these types of inspections are done. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Okay, I'm going Senator Beidle, and I'm not sure who was first, Reedy or Mounts, but we'll come to your side next. Senator Beidle. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. I know, and I agree with, with the Senator from Baltimore City, that there are hundreds of thousands of tax dollars lost every year. And I, I've seen some of the issues and actually knew very well a police officer who served with the ATF to track down these truckloads full of, of uh, cigarettes coming out of Virginia and other, other states. And I, I don't think they'll just go in willy-nilly. Obviously, they're going to be able to look for cigarettes that don't have the tax seal on them and, you know, the Maryland seal. So I, I really think that, um, I, I guess I, I trust I trust this department to do the right thing and, and to help us get the tax dollars that we deserve to collect. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. So we'll go Senator Reedy, then Senator Mounts, then Senator Guile. Uh, yeah, Madam Chair, I, I want people to be um, following the law and we want to enforce the law as it relates to taxation. We don't want smuggling, definitely. I just have a lot of heartburn about warrantless search with no parameters. And I, I, I'm i concerned about that. We didn't have the benefit of a Senate hearing we did get a full hearing we, you know when the house bill came over and they they've done a good job of explaining what their concerns are i think the amendment is a good amendment because it just gives a little bit of a guardrail because a warrantless search means they can go in and search it and look for anything um and i know they're not going looking for necessary criminal activity that's not their purview but i just i think a, a, some guardrails is really appropriate i don't think we want to pass i mean gosh we've got bills we've got bills maybe coming to the senate floor today about getting rid of the ability to search uh, based on, you know, let, not letting police search things um, when there's based on the evidence of actual wrongful activity. So I, I think it would be smart to have, I think the amendment's a good amendment. We don't want warrantless, just totally unfettered warrantless searches by uh, a, an agent of the government, in my opinion. So I, I support the amendment. Thank you, Senator. Senator Mounts. Um, yeah, just, just quickly uh, to add, you know, two cents uh, to the discussion. Um, um, this is no no concern or slight on the agency. I just um, um, 
would have a difficult time voting to give, you know, uh, blanket authority for warrantless searches. I also appreciate the different um, scenarios around the state. And I think the amendment by having the reasonable and articulable measure is a very workable measure. And, um, you know, it, it may actually work out uh, to be a benefit uh, for the agency because it, it, it would, it could act as, as a, um, as a as a way of focusing the searches and how they're done so they don't go awry but i just uh, outside of the argument of of the specifics of the bill the concept of saying we're going to just authorize um warrantless warrantless searches to me is asking for for an issue and a problem i'm not sure how it would come up but there's so many different circumstances where it could so thank, i'm going to support the amendment thank you senator guile Madam Chair, um, I just want to agree with um, my colleague here from Anne Arundel County, Senator Vidal, as well as I also agree with the statements made by uh, Senator Hayes on this topic. I mean, I to Senator Hershey's point about there's not uh, written testimony, I had the opportunity to meet with the individuals from ATC, and they actually did indeed, I think they did do the work. They explained to me the reason why they needed this. They actually had a, a very nicely put together slide presentation. I'm not sure why it didn't make it into the testimony packet here, but, um, but, but I, I do think that they articulated well why they need this to the point of, of warrantless searches. I mean, it, this is, these are not private individuals or these are um, businesses that have the privilege of a license to sell certain products. And we already have warrantless searches in for, for alcohol. We have already talked about in the context of cannabis. Um, I, and I, I think if you have the privilege of having that license, you make yourself subject um, that to, to, to these types of searches. So, um, I, I support the bill and, um, and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator, Senator Ellis. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. And so, um, I'm just uh, looking at this bill right here and, uh, I don't see a cross file listed. Uh, so there, that means there's no cross file. No cross file. Yeah. So generally, you know, uh, this is like late in the session and we have so many issues and, uh, after crossover, this bill came over and we we're here discussing it late and so much to kind of comprehend. This is a really big issue. And if it's a cross file and we have earlier enough time to really speak to different sides and to really have the idea, the issue baked in, at least for me. And uh, I'm just really concerned about warrantless searches. I mean, I have a constituent in my district that for two years uh, he was uh, watched and followed uh, as a uh, liquor store. This tobacco, I know a different issue, but at a liquor store and we have residency requirement uh, for a liquor licensee in Charles County to uh, be a resident of the county. So this person, he was under suspicion and he was watched for two years by the authorities and just a tremendous stress on his family. And, and while he's operating his business and he was uh, affluent, had several homes and uh, he was followed home in his county outside. I mean, watched and just really onerous and took a lot of money, a lot of time. And I believe that anytime government have unlimited power to do warrantless anything, it's a problem. Uh, they could pick on someone because they just don't like the car he or she drives. They could pick on someone because they don't like his race or her race. They don't like the person they're dating. I mean, it just, um, it, it seems like it's too much power for a government agency to really have. And because like I said, I have a constituent who eventually after several years resolved that issue of residency in the county, but, Sometimes it can get down to really harassment. And I think we, as a society, we need guardrails. Uh, if there is suspicion of illegal activity, there are processes to go and receive uh, permission to do investigation, you know, and, but given any government agency unlimited, unfeathered power in this democracy is problematic to me. And I think I really haven't had a conversation with the parties enough during the process, which this big power, uh, I won't say power grab, but 
uh, reach for power to really do this, that it's an important uh, issue. It's a really problematic issue. And I believe that anyone who, whether they, no matter what kind of business they have, they're Americans and they have to go through the proper constitutional protections in order to uh, secure their businesses. And so this issue is problematic. Uh, it requires more debate. I wish we had more debate. I wish we had more time uh, to uh, deal with the uh, issue. And, um, you know, it's just really, um, I'm not sure exactly how I would uh, vote on this. No. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator. Back to Senator Hayes. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm sorry. I, I thought uh, Senator Giles was, Giles was going to go up. Um, I, I totally understand my colleagues' concerns. Um, in, in this case, this is, you know, creating parity where alcohol already exists in cannabis um, as well. The We put, a, as, as Senator Kramer spoke to before, we put a great deal of work in, in um, lifting up the ATC and they have, um, in many regards, exceeded our expectations and as far as trans, you know, uh, was it uh, transparency um, and other things? This is simply another tool in their toolbox to make sure that Marylanders are protected and that the the state is protected and making sure that people aren't doing nefarious things that will one, you know, bring into question our public safety or otherwise reduce the amount of revenue um, to our state. And so um, I think given the, the stellar reputation of this organization and what they've done on behalf of our, our constituents and, and, our, um, and, and the state of Maryland, that we should give them the tools that they need to necessarily complete their tasks. Thank you, Senator Kramer. Yeah, one final comment, Madam Chair, in that, again, I'd like to remind the committee, alcohol, very limited number of licenses compared to those for cigarettes. This opens the door. Every single business, gas station, convenience store, drug store, grocery store, um, even a restaurant that has retail sales, whatever it may be, wherever there's retail sales of a tobacco product, this opens the door now. The bill before you puts what I think is a very reasonable and limited guardrail. And I would also echo my colleague's concern with regard to the ATC. But the executive director, who I have great respect for and is very well respected, isn't going to always be the executive director, folks. He may decide to retire. I hope you're not, Jeff. Uh, but he could retire tomorrow. We could have a very different alcohol, tobacco, cannabis commission with different ambitions, different goals. We are the ones responsible for putting the guardrails in regardless of whomever it is that is the executive director or is in place. I think this is a very important amendment. Um, and I think it's very respectful of our fourth amendment. And with that, I'm out, Madam Chair. <laughs> Thank you. I'm gonna to go to Senator Lamb who hasn't spoken on this issue and then I'll go back to you, Senator Guile. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I do um, appreciate the points that were brought up by Senator Vidal, Senator Guile. I think um, they seem reasonable. I, I, so I'm hesitant to, um, you know, to to include this this amendment, I guess my my other thought is if, as an alternative to the amendment, could there simply be notification to um, the licensees on renewal? You know, if that was if if um, uh, if we didn't move forward with the amendment as an alternative. I'm sorry. Can you restate what your suggestion is, just so that I'm clear? So that the licensees would be notified that they can be um, that investigators can come on site like that. I think from nowhere. Yeah, I appreciate I your comments. I do think that should this bill pass, all of those who are impacted would be notified. I'm seeing nods from the commission. Um, and and just to weigh in, I haven't weighed in, so I'll I'll kind of say one of the things that that um, the bill brought 
forward for me, there is a, a, a real problem in Prince George's County, a real and legitimate problem. Mm -hmm. And I think the bill seeks to address it. And um, I do not think, and I don't think anybody's implying that the ATC would go rogue and just start, you know, unreasonably, uh, you know, running in and out of facilities, but that's my two cents. Senator Guile. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just, just real quickly. I just, um, I, I know that uh, Senator Ellis had, has, had raised some questions about, and, and I agree we're on the last day here to, to be working on this, um, um, but um, that there wasn't a cross file. And I know in speaking, if I could just offer and speaking with the, with the folks from ATC, it's partly because that there was a change of jurisdiction, you know, of, of what subject matters the committees were covering and having new members. They, they, they had somebody in mind to do a cross file here and that didn't happen to fruition. So that if I could just offer that as an explanation of why we didn't have an opportunity to have it as a Senate file. So thank you. And thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Hayes, for final comments. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I have a little bit of new information based off of um, what Senator Kramer was saying. The fear that, you know, this is more expansive um, and that it could be grocery stores and other things. I just remind the committee that currently there's 9,000 um, alcoholic beverage licenses in the state. Um, as opposed to only 6,000 tobacco licenses in our state. And, and again, this is a privilege for businesses to have this license. Some stores and retailers, such as I think it's CVS maybe, um, have already um, decided not to have tobacco in their product and as a product that they offer. Um, this is essentially something that you have to apply for. And as a result of applying and receiving that privilege, um, you would be held to that standard. That's all. Okay, thank you. Senator Ellis. One quick question, ma'am. No colloquy right there. Uh, someone mentioned there is notice. If this bill passed, there's notice. Uh, could someone uh, delve into what notice is that? It's not really clear. So your question is how are retailers notified? And notified of what? Of the provisions of the bill, should we adopt it? They shouldn't, yeah, well, no one, yeah, I don't think anyone wants an announcement. Uh, so you want to know from, can someone from the commission come quickly, guys, and just let us know how the, I'm told, 6,000 tobacco mm -hmm. licensees, how are the 9,000 alcohol licensees notified of this? Thank story? you, Madam Chair. For the record, I'm Jeff Kelly, the Executive Director of the Alcohol and Tobacco Commission, and thanks for giving us so much deliberation, especially on the last day. Um, it's not a provision currently, it's a, it's a, it's a good idea. Uh, one of the things we try to do uh, to be more transparent all along is we have uh, a system where we force out emails. We, ha we have thousands of subscribers now to our system where when we send out notifications, we send out a change in regulation, just training capabilities as well, just telling them, hey, be aware of this. Uh, we send out almost monthly anyway, some type of advisory. So that's one thing we can do, drop of a hat very easily. If it's the desire that the General Assembly uh, have us be a little bit more forthcoming, and I think we do this anyway, we would send out notifications to the various trade associations that represent so many of the marketers, and we'll cover, you know, most of them in that sense too. Not everybody is as easily is as easy to connect to, but to that extent, we do. Gosh, I'd say thousands of inspections a year. We can hand out a brochure as we're there doing an inspection and saying, "Hey." Be forewarned, we can do this. Maybe we won't do it this time, but we're going to be from now on moving forward. We could be doing these inspections. So there's a variety of ways for us to do it. I don't know if it's as simple as putting something in the mail, but it's not a stretch to ask us to do that. And it's something we would probably do anyway, just because it's a pretty good idea. Thank you. Senator Beidel. Thank you, Madam Chair. May I ask Mr. Kelly a quick question? Thank you. What does a pack of cigarettes cost today with the proper taxes paid? It's north of ten dollars, probably just shy of eleven. And so, if someone is illegally importing, um, say, cigarettes from Virginia, what's their profit then on that pack of cigarettes? If assuming they make the same sales price, which they often do, yeah, uh, the difference in taxation, which is really where it is, is three dollars and forty-five cents. Maryland's three dollars and forty-five cents higher. Higher than, than Virginia. So, so if they're doing this illegally, they're making three dollars and forty-five cents a pack if they're selling at the current price. That's correct, sir. Per pack of cigarettes. That's correct, and, and our seizures no. are thousands. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So we have before us first, um, like to take up these amendments separately because you have the, the first part of the amendment, which is um, dealing with the Department of Public Health, right? Uh, well, Can, there, there's there's three, there's basically 
there's the First Amendment in the reprint, which is clarifying language from the governor's office regarding the study. Okay. And then the let's the do that one first. Okay. Okay. On the 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 amendment dealing with the study, I have a motion and a second for a favorable on that amendment. Seeing no questions, all those in favor, raise your hand. That amendment is adopted unanimously. Um, the second amendment. Okay, there's there's two parts to Senator Kramer's amendments, and they deal with each part of the code where this language was in there originally, and it's being replaced by this one: cigarette sales. The other one would be uh, other tobacco products, and then there's the ED uh, electronic smoking electronic delivery smoking systems provisions. And as it came in, it said it would be the health department or the uh, or the uh, uh, ATC could do warrantless searches. This would specify that and it would just make it the only people who could do these uh, warrantless searches with probable cause as the as, as the, the amendment was first proposed. Only the ATC could do these kind of searches. OK, so that's that amendment strikes the provision related to the health department doing those searches. Senator Kramer. Yes, Madam Chair. So my motion would be to strike the language in the amendment that says probable cause insert a reasonable. Senator, can yes. we take up the public health one first and then deal with the second part? Yeah, I, it's all one amendment, but if okay. you think we can, no, well, if you can, if we can separate them out, that's yeah, fine. I think that we can, I think that we can take the, I think there's consensus around the health department not doing these. Okay. So on the health department amendment, have a motion and a second on the health department not conducting the, okay. All those in favor of that part, raise your hand. That is unanimous as well. Now we're going to have you restate the one that we have discussed at, at length this morning that we don't have in writing before us. So we want you to carefully state that amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would reiterate that the extent of the change is to strike the two words probable cause from the amendment and in their place insert there is the following, a reasonable, articulable suspicion in the place of probable cause so that we are putting in some minimal guardrails uh, with what we're doing, Madam Chair, and I would move the amendment. Okay, I have a motion and a second for a favorable on the words reasonable and articulable suspicion. We're going to take a roll call. Vice Chair Klausmeyer. Yeah. Yes. Senator Kramer. Yes. Yes. Senator Hayes. No. No. Senator Reedy. Yes. Yes. Senator Ellis. Yes. Yes. Senator Mounts. Yes. Yes. Senator Guile. No. No. Senator Lamb. <laughs> no. Senator Beidel. No. No. Senator Hershey. Yes. Yes. Madam Chair. No. No. Right. Uh, uh, to be, I have a clarifying. So are we saying a reasonable articulable? There's no conjunction in between, correct? It's reasonable articulable suspicion. suspicion. Okay. Okay, that amendment is adopted on a six to five vote. So you now have before you House Bill 1000 as amended and re-amended. Have a motion and a second for a favorable on House Bill 1000 as amended. All those in favor, raise your hand. That's nine. Those opposed, raise your hand. That's two. <laughs> okay, so we have a vote change. So that, that bill, as amended, is adopted eight to three. Eight to three on a favorable. All right, that concludes our work for this morning. I have a couple of things. If you could just stay put real quick before we go to the floor. We're going to sign off.